it is uh, uh, really quite a, uh, an honor for me to introduce uh, the, the third lecturer uh, for the Summer Design Institute, uh, Carrie Norman. Uh, Carrie is a founding partner of Norman Kelly uh, with Thomas Kelly. Uh, the practice was established in 2012 and is operated jointly between New Orleans and Chicago. Their work re-examines architecture and design's relationship to vision and prompts its observers to see nuance in the familiar. Norman Kelly's work has been published in Log, Avery Review, Mass Context, Architect Magazine, Domus, and Design, among others. The practice has contributed, contributed work to the 14th and 17th Architecture Biennial and the inaugural Chicago Architecture Biennial. Norman Kelly was the recipient of the Architecture League of New York Young Architects Prize in 2014. Uh, and Carrie Norman is currently an assistant professor in architecture at Tulane University. She has taught design studios and seminars at Harvard University Graduate School of Design, UPenn, Columbia GSAP, Barnard College, and NJIT. Uh, she holds a master's of architecture from Princeton University, but more importantly, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture with Honors from the University of Virginia. Uh, Carrie, it is really uh, great to be able to have you here today, uh, not only because we get to see uh, uh, an incredible body of work, uh, but also because I think your work is very central to many of the ideas that we're actually exploring uh, uh, this summer uh, in SDI. <laughs> SDI. Uh, key among them, I would highlight two that I think for me are essential, maybe three. Uh, the first one is the way that your practice explores architecture as an iterative process, right? And across multiple media. Uh, when one looks at your work, when you're, one looks at your website, uh, you see text, you see video, you see uh, uh, drawing, you see images, and the, the ebb and flow between these different sort of approaches, I think is something that for me is fascinating. Uh, and I think uh, it aligns very well uh, with uh, uh, a lot of the work that uh, uh, we're doing this summer. Uh, the other is this idea of drawings as a vehicle of discovery. Uh, used both as a tool to advance an idea, to explore an idea, but also as a way to address multiple audiences. Uh, and that multivalent presence, uh, it, for me, is very important uh, in your work. Uh, and maybe the third point that I would make has more to do with uh, uh, something we discussed a few weeks back. Uh, Carrie and I uh, knew we, I knew we couldn't take Carrie out for dinner tonight, so we coincided in New Orleans and had drinks uh, to discuss the lecture a few weeks back. Uh, is this idea of sort of understanding software as a way to engage drawing rather than simply modeling space? Uh, and I think that that's something that's very present in your work. Uh, and key to the work we're doing uh, this summer. So Kerry, uh, welcome back to UVA. Uh, we wish we could ho host you in person, uh, but for now, um, uh, hosting you uh, uh, the via Zoom uh, will do. Uh, welcome. Um, thanks so much, Felipe. And uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, and of course, thank you to, to all of you, the students um, and the faculty um, for joining tonight's presentation. Of course, it's an honor to, to return um, to UVA um, and to be here tonight. So I'm Carrie Norman. Um, as Felipe mentioned, I'm one half of the research collaborative Norman Kelly. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and try to <clears throat> share the presentation. Can you guys see it okay? Perfect. Um, so as I understand it, uh, the Summer Design Institute is sort of a primer to prepare you all uh, for the kind of critical and technical demands of studio to, to come in the fall. Um, and that of course, drawing is a, is a, is, as a mode of critical inquiry is really central to this. So in considering how I'd approach tonight's talk, um, which will of course devote um, significant discussion to drawing enabler, um, indeed architecture's enabler, and that is vision. Uh, is the title of tonight's presentation. And it asks what happens when you stop looking hurriedly and start seeing slowly. And it also describes the way my 
Um, generally, a project begins with acts of vision and ends in revision. So put another way, this is a, a process of observation and alteration. More broadly, um, our work re-examines architecture's relationship to perceptive perception through deceptive optics. So let's start with, with this image. Anyone? Terry, okay, I think we're losing sound uh, uh, intermittently. Uh, it might be a good idea. Maybe if you turn off the, uh, the screen, uh, that might help. Is this what you meant? No, sorry, turn off your camera. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. I think that might, uh, 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 let's see if that helps. Thank you. Let's hope, let me know if it's, if it doesn't return. So far, so good. Good, 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 good. So starting with this image, uh, if you look a little closer, uh, this is what we call an icon um, or a tricking of the eye in the form of a wooden duck decoy used by duck hunters to make their prey feel more comfortable. The term is used to refer to a North American hunting tradition of crafting wooden bird decoys dating back to the 19th century. These icons or confidence decoys as they were sometimes called were not replicas of the species being hunted. There were of course those too, but rather replicas of other species placed among those decoys so as to float a familiar scene. So here, a fake mallard is used to lure a real heron. Felipe, is the audio better? The audio is perfect, yep. Excellent. So like the wooden duck decoy, our work in many cases depends on the firmness of legibility to operate. So what do I mean by that? Uh, well, it, it means that generally the work is not visually abstract, but rather it relies on familiarity to construct visual relationships between the observer and that which he or she observes. For instance, if you look closely enough, a circle is also a sphere or maybe even a window. In the past, we have likened this intent to something approximating magic. In a way, isn't an architect also a magician? Isn't she someone who alters the familiar? We consider this outlook an earnest one. The architect is a mediator between two and three dimensions. So far, this has been primarily a visual experiment, but we're working on expanding our senses. So thank you for your attention tonight. And I invite you to sit back, slow your gaze, and look patiently as I discuss our work that swerves between two and three dimensions. So this includes uh, drawings, objects, and rooms. The first are drawings defined as a one-to-one -one set of superficial marks drawn using graphite, ink, vinyl, or paint. In most instances, the drawings are site-specific, temporary, and corrective. Though the style of projection is highly abstracted, their content is highly literal. The second are objects and our studies in transposition. Like impersonations, our objects are our furniture like doubles who cause style, type, and function to change places with each other. And the third are rooms. A room is a closed interior, often accessed through no more than two existing doors. Surgical in appearance, our rooms grow from the surfaces of an existing room. Like a Gregor Schneider room, our rooms are designed to speculate on altered readings of existing form, function, and meaning. So with that, let's dive deeper into drawings. A drawing tends to begin with someone else's drawing, or at least someone else's definition of a drawing. The drawings shown here are scaled reproductions of a one-to-one -one mark embossed or painted upon an actual architectural surface 
be it a wall or a floor or the ground. In all but one of these examples, the drawing is performed on the architecture by the architect. The black sheep is at the top left. The artist Blinky Palermo's black right angle. In this case, the drawing was meant to correct or rather embarrass an existing shortcoming in proportion and was originally exhibited alongside Gerhard Richter's toilet drawing. The drawing can also be transposed from one picture plane to another to add new meaning. Here, da Vinci's study on the proportions of head and eyes gets transposed by hand onto the face of a toddler-sized mannequin. We call this sort of an exercise in spherical projection. The first time we drew on a building was in Rome in 2014. The site was the 1913 McKim Mead and White Palazzo, home to the American Academy in Rome. I think it was in this exact position as pictured on the right where I met Brad Cantrell for the first time. If you've ever visited the building, you'll recall a strange hallway on its second floor. On one side are eight doors that lead to eight scholars offices with windows facing an interior courtyard. On the other side is a blank wall measuring approximately 100 feet long and 12 feet high. The corridor measures only 32 inches wide. If you look through the blank wall, if you could, you would be looking down into the main reading room of the two-story Arthur and Janet C. Ross Library, home to a rare book section designed by Michael Graves. Although they appear disconnected, the hallway and library are adjacent in plan and section. As is the case with certain mannerist buildings, or in this case, a mannerist copy, the front facade is of primary importance and will often yield residual aberrations. The corridor was clearly an afterthought. Using graphite transfer paper and some ink highlights, the corridor is superficially transformed. Five archways are drawn, a building aberration corrected, and a view is liberated. The corridor and the library get connected by way of an anamorphic projection or distorted view that can only be experienced by a, sing a single vantage point. With aid of some attenuating line work, a viewer looks down into the library one story below. Like a blinky Palermo wall painting, the fix is superficial and was eventually painted over, returning the wall to its mistake. The first time we drew in a building in New York, we acted like brats. For the Architecture League of New York's Young Architects exhibition in 2014, we depicted the largest trapezoidal window of the now Met Royer building. The window itself was drawn to scale, but more importantly, we drew the facing buildings one would see looking out from the window at the side of Madison Avenue. At the time, I suppose we were a little frustrated to not get a window spot in the exhibition. So we drew one instead. When we drew on a building in Chicago, we used uh, drawing to consider the scale of the neighborhood. In this case, our context was the community of Pilsen. We toured the neighborhood and took careful note of its ad hoc brick patterns. A storefront for the Chicago Art Department clad with plywood became the canvas for a taxonomy of over 30 different brick patterns. The patterns were eventually bonded, dimensioned, and painted a color to match the building's neighbor. Our hope was that the assemblage reminded the community of its layered history. And the third time we drew in Chicago completely changed our way of thinking about drawing. Here we saw a drawing and its scope match that of any building project we've taken on. In 2015, the Chicago Architecture Biennial tasked us with platting the 65 Mich Michigan Avenue facing windows of the Chicago Cultural Center. The challenge was twofold. For one, the drawing needed to function like a sign and steal attention from Anish Kapoor's bean sculpture across the street, as well as invigorate the lesser known of Chicago's two Shepley Routin and Coolidge Beaux-Arts buildings. The one most people visit in Chicago is the Art Institute. The second charge was to respond to Stanley Tigerman's 1977 prompt the state of the art of architecture. We thought it best to try our hat at practicing populism. We began by looking at the way Chicagoans looked out and onto their city. 
More specifically, we began by looking closely at Chicago's architectural history through its fenestration styles. For example, our Chicago office is located in the Monadnock building, and through our 19th century masonry wall, we face Harry Weiss's prison. Or did you know that people actually pay a premium in the Hancock building to have their view obstructed by its X bracing? And though we began with actual references, the taxonomy grew into a system of normalizing Chicago's history of looking in and out of its buildings. The aim was to provide a revised history of Chicago's architectural styles that included forgotten heroes like Keck and Keck or the Burnham Brothers, as well as a reminder to passers-by of how curtains or blinds are equally as important to elevating or disguising a view as our actual mullions or sash hardware. But perhaps most akin to a building with a budget and a client, our taxonomy was loose in terms of composition and coverage. The vinyl only accounted for 50% coverage of the full window site and allowed the curators, as well as the building's standard occupants, to arrange the vinyl decals as they saw appropriate for allowing light into the interior exhibitions and office spaces. Perhaps one of our favorite photographs is our Palladian style window photobombing MIT and ETH's rock print with its shadow. Sometimes our drawings are neither corrective or entirely two dimensional. <laughs> In the spring of 2018, we were invited by the curator, Irene Sunwu, to design the exhibition for a show on these two characters, the artist and architect Shisaku Arakawa and his collaborator and wife, the poet and philosopher, Madeline Ginz. The exhibition entitled Arakawa and Madeline Ginz Eternal Gradient, held at the Arthur Ross Architecture Gallery at Columbia University, featured over 40 original drawings by the artist architect duo. Unfortunately, uh, complications in the curation process emerged as a result of legal disputes between two foundations, each of which claimed ownership of Arakawa and Gin's body of work. In the late stages of the curation process, many drawings initially selected for exhibition were prohibited due to the ongoing legal battles of ownership. That included this sketch uh, from one of Arakawa and Gin's most significant projects the mechanism of meaning. In any case, the project, including the drawing pictured here, was from, forbidden from the show. So to include it required an act of what we like to call architectural smuggling. While the practice of forgery is often in service of deception and its product invalidating, our role as the exhibition's designer recast it as an act of recovery. The result is, on one hand, a drawing approximating Arakawa's original sketch, and on the other, a series of objects for the display of framed works in archival ephemera, or we like to think of it as drawings inside of a drawing. So this project doesn't fit neatly within the category of drawings, but falls somewhere between drawing and our next medium objects. From this view, uh, pictured here, the boundary between two and three dimensions or vinyl and steel is most clear. Like our other drawings fleeting fate, perceiving Arakawa's reconstructed sketch is only temporarily perceived. If you look too fast, you might miss it. As the viewer moves through the exhibition, the steel structures privilege other modes of seeing. So like drawings, the objects we make take on multiple meanings. When it comes to objects, we typically design them as if they were constrained by a singular projection, an elevation, or a plan. Oblique combinations of either of these projections tend to offer a more economical description of the object. In this case, we wanted to design a table whose form presupposed movement, in this case, a drop leaf, but replaced its movable qualities with a form that offered an economical posture. We fixed a standard drop leaf table and sheared it by 20 degrees. You'll notice both the front and back elevations offer identical and simultaneous viewing of the short and long faces. Here, the table as it was presented during the Spaces Without Drama exhibition, curated by LIGA, Space for Architecture at the Graham Foundation in the spring of 2017. 
The show's prompt involved tracing similarities between theatrical stage sets and architecture scale models. In our case, the table's horizontal surface served as the ground for restaging itself amidst its immediate context. The resultant prop adheres to its life-size counterpart and resolution only. Its tectonic, however, is reduced to a two-dimensional cutout, bringing into focus the exhibition subtitle. Surface is an illusion, but so is depth. The next set of objects titled Wrong Chairs were our first foray into furniture design. I would remind you here that we are not furniture designers, but rather furniture appropriators. We believe that architects have designed enough chairs. So we return to a familiar type, the American Windsor, and look at it through a new lens of intentional mistake making. We discovered the cut sheets of Dr. John Casset on how to make American Windsor furniture, and we began to study them carefully. The Windsor type is incredibly simple in its tectonics. Back and legs plug into a raised ground or seat. So we confuse its restaging by reading the cut sheets elevations literally. In the case of the set T, we intentionally collapse the half front elevation, typically used to indicate mirrored symmetry, and the side elevation as a complete front elevation. On the left, Dr. John Casse's original drawings and on the right, our redrawn elevation. The result is a chair that compresses its two seated occupants. This strategy of deploying tectonic and superficial error in nuanced ways would play out six more times in slightly different ways. Here is the complete set of unaltered elevations, and here are the complete set of altered elevations. The completed pieces were made in collaboration with Reeves Rash in Kentucky and third generation wood turners in Ohio. Uh, originally designed as a dining set, actually, the chairs were exhibited um, in Chicago at Volume Gallery as individuals within a two dimensional white wall gallery. I'll point out a few of our favorites and their traits. Uh, here's a side chair with confusing mirrored symmetry. Here, a high chair with rotated leg bracing to provide a ladder to its back with an omitted crest rail. And here, an end chair with one of the least noticeable transpositions, a shifted leg support. And here, a stool where visual surprises yielded a tactile one. When seated on the stool, an approximated curve lends its user clarity between left and right. And here I remind you that in all cases, the chairs return to function like chairs when a body activated them. Speaking of the body, has anyone here practiced ballet? If so, then you'll know that to practice ballet, your body needs to be proportioned like this body, no taller than five foot six, unfortunately. This was part of the research conducted during our collaboration with the dancer, choreographer, and artist, Brendan Fernandez. He was interested in designing objects or devices for durational performances. In short, a ballet dancer would be required to hold a canonical position, arabesque second position, for instance, for an uninterrupted interval of 10 minutes or so before being allowed to walk or stretch. We designed a custom scale figure to manipulate into the exact positions Brendan required. Like a Neufert diagram, our collaboration demanded drawing the ballet dancer's positions with precise specifications and would include a, a set of custom designed figures such as the one pictured on the left to pressure Brendan's dancers into idealized positions. On the right, a dancer holding in arabesque pose. You'll see where each project makes contact with the body, her heel in this case, the object is wrapped in leather. And here a dancer holding in camber on the ground pose for approximately 10 minutes during the 2019 Whitney Biennial. In total, five objects were designed for five specific poses. <clears throat> for the design of our collection titled Young Americans, we redraw George Washington's Mount Vernon study 
The original study pictured here houses one of the most eclectic and strange collections of 18th and 19th century furniture. I should add that neither of us have visited the space in person, but upon observing this setting from Mount Vernon's web-based virtual tour, we understood this scene as an accumulation of inconsistent styles and intents. In other words, a group show. The altar drawing includes two of our own insertions, the fixed tilt top mirror table, which is situated in the middle corner and the roll top armchair, which is located in the lower right. The pieces second group show would prove as diverse and strange a setting as their first. The pieces were presented at Friedman Benda Gallery in New York in 2018 for an exhibition on apparatic furniture curated by Juan Garcia Mosqueda. In the foreground, a table designed by Moss Architects and in between a room divider designed by the Brooklyn-based design studio known as Andy and Dave. In isolation, the pieces question and advance social narratives that once attended the object's original dimensions and proportions. The original tilt top tea table, more than the teapot or the teacup that rested on its surface, was the object by which the ritual of tea drinking gained its recognition and acceptance. The quote unquote brash honesty, or let's call it gossip, that characterized tea table discussions constituted a sort of circumspection that effectively policed the actions of the powerful and elite by threatening to expose scandal and subject any wrongdoers to ridicule. Our revision or alteration extends the watchful eye of the tilt top tea table by lengthening the pedestal to elevate the vertically oriented tabletop. At this height, upon close range, the observers offered her reflection in the mirrored finish of its convex surface. The roll top armchair finds its origins around the same time, just following the American Revolution. Although the fondness for English styles had faded, this styles labeling itself federal found itself enthusiastically embraced by Americans. Among the federal styles notable forms were secretaries and writing desks. Within this variety, flexible timbre and roll top screens were new technologies and could quickly conceal an unkept work surface. Our revision narrows the roll top desk to the width of a chair and substitutes the stack of drawers and shelves with perimeter aligned upholstered cushions. Much simpler uh, in construction is our most recent collection of two by four furniture we contributed to the American Framing Pavilion at this year's Venice Biennale. We were tasked with creating furniture from leftover material used to construct the American Pavilion's installation. Our pieces became a zero waste effort in creating furniture entirely out of parts cut from standard two by four wooden studs. So here, the patterns of cuts and plan one would make on a two by four. Silent how-to films accompany basic assembly drawings like these to be constructed by rough carpenters on site. Taken together, our goal was to produce a set of instructions that would allow anyone independent of skill level to make their own furniture. The results neatly blend into their context framed by the same material used to construct them. The one exception is their variegated staining the two by fours were stained prior to being ripped. The contrast between the outer stained edges and the lighter unstained interior produces a mysterious puzzle of the two by fours pattern of cuts. Similarly simple in its construction, but no less impactful of a history is this chair. One of our favorite elements from the two projects we contributed to make new history, the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial were a pair of chairs, this chair. As part of a collaboration with Sylvia Laban, Aaron Besler, and Jessica Colangelo, we were tasked with reimagining, reenacting, and restaging a photograph. Re was a big part of the show. The photograph, uh, originally taken in 1984 on your left, 
was used to advertise the opening of Oa Munger's recently completed German architecture museum, the dam. In the image, you see a curator seated upon a chair overlooking a collection of postmodern models. Some of the models were fake models, some were authentic. The exhibition on your right consisted of a room made entirely out of foam, models made entirely out of paper, and that chair made entirely out of wood. The chair was noticeably uncomfortable, but key in positioning our curator, Sylvia, in a similar way to that of the original curator. The mise-en-scene would have been incomplete without an object that belonged to Owen Munger's original lecture hall. If scaled and finished appropriately, an object has the potential to carry with it all of the implications of the room to which it originally belongs. This invisible transference is what makes the object capable of being overlooked. So overlooked that we think the exhibition manager may have tossed the chairs after the exhibition closed. If thought of through their temporal means, where drawings last the length of an exhibition and objects move around, then rooms are the closest thing to permanent we have designed thus far. Oh, and they're also bigger. Like Schinkel, the stagecraft becomes fixed. What follows are three commercial rooms. One of our recently completed rooms was informed by an object this object to be precise. You are looking at a wall shelf with chrome plated tubular steel supports and wooden shelves. If you look closely at the shelves, you'll see that they are not fixed to the front tube. Instead, they cantilever off the back tube. A minor illusion, but nonetheless significant. The detail was originally designed by Mies van der Rohe at a larger scale for a 1930 commission for Philip Johnson's New York apartment. However, the first production of the shelf in the freestanding version shown here was in 1937, designed for the architect's daughter's house in Ratno, a small town near Berlin. The type would manifest itself in a variety of forms, sometimes clad in a reflective finish like at the Tugendhat house. The object would become a point of departure for relaxing a series of domestic museum details within the thousand square feet of Aesop's Lincoln Park store. The concept uh, of relaxing these details was presented to the client as a single collage pictured here. In the image, you can glimpse Stanley Tigerman's Titanic or sinking of Crown Hall in Lake Michigan with the foregrounded niece who looks unfazed. At any rate, our design negotiates its existing conditions through a rotational symmetry observed from the entrance. Upon entering, you see the Miesian shelves presented to you as you that might have been in, in Philip Johnson's apartment. The existing interior consisted of a strange relationship with its basement in an adjacent alleyway. Our correction would wedge the circulation down to the basement into a gap of flooring, barely 36 inches wide, ahead of an existing window wall facing a tree in an alleyway. The new configuration would connect two spaces with a 36 inch elevation change by way of a tiny L staircase. We would also create an invisible vestibule between the main sales floor and its shared hallway to avoid visibility of a prominent exit sign. The main room was eventually curated around three primary elevations of ripped sawn walnut veneer panels. Images like this, a photographic elevational survey, were constructed after photographing and ca cataloging each panel once it was stained. Together with the client, the position of each panel was studied to provide us even a distribution of texture, direction, and tone. Comparably, our goal was to make Mises' affinity for control, as seen in his use of book-matched wood and stone patterns, look relaxed in comparison to our level of control. And the final photographs of the eastern walls. And here the south walls elevational survey and the final photograph of the south wall. And finally, the west walls elevational survey and the final photograph of the west wall. Much of our obsession over drawings comes from an obsession with Agnes Martin. 
If you had a chance to see her retrospective at the Guggenheim a few years ago, you would have been hit with two realizations. One, the work is beautiful. And two, the work is incredibly boring. The second observation is most important to the design of this room. As part of our first collaboration with Aesop, we focused our attention on the irregularity of one very specific material unit, the buff tone Chicago common brick. The brick is approximately three and a half inches wide and eight inches long with a dimensional tolerance that wavers as much as a half inch. This imperfect tolerance yields numerous difficulties for producing controlled patterns. Like Martin's irregular grids, we sought to take a material usually found on non-street facing exterior walls and ubiquitous around Chicago since the fire of 1871 and use it as a, its dominant finish. To make matters more challenging, we use three different types of Chicago common brick, a full brick, a paper brick, and a queen brick, which is the remaining mass left over after you've cut two pavers from a full brick. The different types allowed us to control the brick's pattern in horizontal and vertical orientations, as well as to balance the existing interior's awkward proportions with a lowered floor and a new heating and cooling system. Three round rooms characterize the existing space, punctuated with what would become a very stubborn column, just off center halfway through the space. Our alterations involved removing the column once a chimney flew for an upstairs apartment and focusing our attention to the perimeter where shelving would fill deepened wall cavities. The narrow recesses between shelving projections would also negotiate the new heating and cooling system while pressuring the interior with more mass. And these are drawings we made early on in the project and reveal a little of our working method through drawing. Like a coloring book, the neutrality of the black and white line drawn perspective lends itself to easy back and forth conversations as to how to fill them in. Each primary direction was studied with this method, here looking from the point of sale toward the storefront here viewing the south wall, and here along the north wall. These drawings also reveal a little of our, let's call it overzealousness with texture. We should add that uh, this was one of our first projects at this scale, and we hadn't honed the practice of restraint. The updated versions re reflect maybe a little greater restraint and control. Uh, that said, we're still sad that the back wall isn't clad in brick. It's a fright we just couldn't win. The project increasingly became an education in the properties of the brick unit. With the dry joint, we were able to extend the non-load bearing pinwheel bond across the corners. So from both the elevation and this rotated view, the pattern remains continuous. In most of Aesop's stores, you'll find a quote somewhere. This detail is typically selected by the client, but in our case, we lost the brick wall, but we won the selection of the quote. A friendly reminder from Stanley Tigerman reads, the grid is abstract as well as realistic. Uh, some more finished photographs, this one of the south wall. You'll see custom designed return air grills on the floor situated in the recessed vertical gaps. This was only possible because we were required to demolish the existing floor and replace it with steel columns and beams to support the weight of the brick. And the north wall. Here the observer is perhaps reminded of a window bay, hence the soldier bond at the top of the vitrines or of the alley wall on this wall's backside. And finally, a detail of the floor to wall transition. You can see the nuance of each brick, including original stampings from the local foundry and a couple. <clears throat> at 5,000 square feet, this is the largest room we've designed. The project is for the conversion of an art gallery to a sneaker come culture shop. To be more accurate, however, this is not one room, but an enfilade made up of 10 rooms. Specific to an enfilade, the rooms are connected, but independent. No doors, only fat thresholds separate the 10 rooms, and each one is designed so that the client is able to theme the space according to a specific product clothing, footwear, apothecary, or event, reading, lecture, transaction. 
The existing space is located on the first floor of a five-story factory building in Chicago's West Loop, a neighborhood once home to the city's meatpacking district. Think of it as Chicago's version of Chelsea. The building's high ceilings and exposed timber recall its industrial past. As of a few years ago, all of the district's buildings have been landmarked and are now home to a booming food tech and hotel industry. The more immediate history of the space is that it was previously home to one of Chicago's most prominent art galleries, owned and operated by the gallerist and collector Rona Hoffman. On the right, a previous exhibition at Hoffman's Gallery of the Iraqi American artist Michael Rakowitz. The primary formal conceit of the project begins with the close observation of its existing structural base. The existing space, once a confection company's loading dock, consists of an eight by three heavy timber structural grid with 14 exposed one foot by one foot columns. Because the space uh, was used as a loading dock, another existing condition of note is a dramatic three foot change in elevation from sidewalk to the main interior of the space. Here's an existing plan of the site. Our client had operated their previous store out of the Northern unit at the top of your screen. The art gallery occupied the larger footprint at the South. Three columns are buried in the demising wall between the two spaces. And the front entry is inaccessible by wheelchair due to the aforementioned three foot grade change. In addition to tearing down a demising wall to join the two spaces, our goal was to bury the majority of its original industrial features, columns, wood beams, and rafters inside thickened walls and a lowered ceiling. To give the space and our client new character, we thought it was wise to disguise its old one, at least in part. The new plan aims to wedge a three by three bay plan inside of the original eight by three bay plan. This primary enfilade looks like a disfigured pinwheel spinning around a central build out space for the client to feature his rotating list of artist and designer collaborations. One thing to note are the remnants of the old plan that remain, brick walls that once housed a vault, for example. In this central area, the ceilings are dropped by two feet, the floor has been left its raw concrete, and the thresholds proportioned to a seven foot tall with a two inch false jam. The result is a series of views that glimpse up to three rooms simultaneously. With regard to the three foot change in elevation between sidewalk and central space I mentioned earlier, the client and we wish to make the space handicap accessible. In doing so, we conceived of a foyer design that would set the merchandising area of the store back by two structural bays. Upon entering the store, you would be tasked with entering the store again. To accommodate a space that would serve as entry as well as an event space, the new ground is comprised of four gentle inclines at a one to 20 slope. The four inclines are spaced so as to allow for steps to mediate the transitions. In Chicago, two other examples of stramp or stair ramp combinations exist. One was designed by Carol Ross Barney for the Chicago Riverwalk and the original was designed by OMA in 2003 for the Student Center at the Illinois Institute of Technology shown here. Here the form similarly doubles as ease, circulation and theater space. However, the distinction between our stramp and OMA's is material. At IIT, the form is monolithic and forged from dyed resin. In our case, several thousand Chicago common brick pavers are used to intensify the fineness of the form and increase the sense of scale within the existing space. One of the rewarding distinctions between this form and others is how it flickers between raked surface and extruded ground. Depending on your vantage point, the brick bond appears seamless or raised, an illusory effect first conceived through drawing. And much of the illusion had to do with the the low riser, the lack of handrails, and a detail that we hope you never see. At the transitions between incline and landing, a mitered brick uses a dry joint to maintain continuity in the bond. A trick we tested out shown earlier at the ASAP Bucktown across its vertical surfaces. 
So here, uh, just a quick sequence of how you might experience the foyer upon entering from the street, at first frontally, and then as you might ascend the stramp, and at night. So in closing, we believe architecture is an accumulation of contingencies, things relating to something other than itself, generally something existing or found within the project's history. In our work, drawings are site specific, objects are altered and rooms are reused. The common thread is an affinity for architecture to succeed something found. The first act of revision is as simple as looking closely. More importantly, what I hope to impart to you all as you begin your architectural education is awareness of the immense resource you all already have, your eyes. Seeing slowly empowers the observer to exercise agency in their perception of an experienced circumstance. In our minds, it's the first act of architecture. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Carrie, for really a, a phenomenal question, uh, sorry, lecture, uh, uh, really quite fantastic. And I'm sure that there are many, many uh, questions from the audience. So uh, uh, please feel free either to just raise your hand or, or type them. Uh, but I think it's better if you raise your hand and uh, uh, just ask them. Uh, in the meantime, a, uh, Carrie, uh, I mean, a lot of sort of thoughts and questions. Uh, a, but before we go into that, uh, it really congratulations for a, a phenomenal body of work. Uh, and there, uh, there are really two things that maybe I'll put on the table. It, the first one has to do with this uh, fascination between objects and their setting, right? And I think it, one of the interesting things that we've been looking at at many of the houses uh, that the students are redrawing uh, is that especially in the houses that were designed by architects for themselves, this relationship between what they designed and what they collected sometimes cannot be separated. Right, and that there's a certain curiosity in objects that ignites the architectural imaginary. Uh, and I see a, a very similar sort of parallel in, the, in your work. So on the one hand, I wonder if you could speak a, a little bit about sort of uh, this fascination with objects, uh, maybe not just in the projects, but in your own life uh, uh, as well, right? What do you like to collect? How does that play uh, an important role in, in your work? Uh, and the second for me has to do uh, with drawing, uh, and specifically with the drawings that he showed for the brick uh, Aesop uh, store, which I find uh, uh, exquisite. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how the process of drawing, right? Because you showed us those beautiful black and white line drawings. How many of those did you do, uh, right, in the process to actually begin to arrive at the final sort of a, a composition? Uh, and how the drawing in many ways facilitate uh, that transition? These are great questions, Felipe. Um, just to <clears throat> begin maybe the first uh, question. I think we've all, especially at the beginning of design, faced the anxiety of the blank page, right? Um, how to begin. And, and, and that's for us where influence or importance with the object, we always find the setting to be the most interesting aspect of the project. And it's really through the kind of close observation or settings, history, um, and, and the... Carrie, unfortunately, we are losing you. Oh no, did that happen during the lecture too? No. The lecture was perfect. For some reason, it's unfortunate, but when the screen is off, when your camera is uh, off, uh, it works perfect. I'll go off again. Yeah, we only have, a, we, it's either or. We can Okay, have... understood. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know where, where I should pick up, but it concerns um, always needing a starting point. And, and so I think for us, um, we never begin a project preconceived uh, with a preconceived idea of, of its form, of its material. Um, all of those decisions get um, are, are sort of derivative. 
um, of, of certain histories within a, a project, within the site. Um, and so the setting is, is, you can't separate the setting from the object or the setting from the room um, or the setting from the drawing, uh, really any of those cases. Um, when it comes to the attention to material um, with our first project uh, with, with Aesop, that was a really our first, um, our first permanent architectural intervention. And material seemed like a good place to start, a good, uh, okay, let's start to understand a very basic um, architectural uh, element. Um, so we just kind of uh, identified brick. And, and, and then as we learned more about brick, we learned its fascinating history within Chicago, within actually the site that um, the project was situated. Um, as I mentioned, the alleyways are typically constructed using um, that type of brick. Um, it's not a, it's, it's typically not used for primary elevation. So we were interested or excited about the opportunity to sort of elevate the, the sort of economical or cheap material for a kind of high end interior finish. Um, and when it came to those black and white line drawings, uh, for us, um, color is, is maybe an area where we have a weakness. And so the black and light, white line drawings for us were very neutral and allowed us to have conversations with the client, like a coloring book. How do you see this uh, being filled in? So in a way, the drawings became a kind of collaborative tool uh, for us to, to engage those decisions. Thank you, uh, Kerry. I think that was uh, a, a, a very clear. And I, I assume that uh, in many ways, yes, the drawings in many ways became uh, a way for the client to be engaged, uh, but also because of the way they're drawn for you then to uh, be able to guide, I think, through drawing that discussion, uh, which sounds, uh, uh, which is fascinating to me. Uh, I think it's really a, a beautiful, beautiful project. With that, I think we've given the audience enough time to uh, uh, prepare questions. So. Who's ready? Devin? Well, I, 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 I just wanted to also echo my appreciation of the beautiful work that was shown in the lecture and, and of the, the work that you have on your website and, and so forth. And, and one of the things that I also wanted to pick up on <clears throat> that I think Felipe's question got to a little bit was the value potentially of, of uh, constructing 3D space through 2D orthographic or axonometric or perspectival drawings, um, as opposed to um, other methods that I think have become more, perhaps more efficient with you know, contemporary digital tools and softwares. And um, I guess, you know, I'm I'm curious of whether and you didn't speak specifically about this, but if in your process you have a particular um, kind of position relative to, to what uh, gets, you know, potentially modeled, what gets always kind of drawn as, as you know, as 3D space in a 2D kind of constructed realm. So, and I'm, I don't know, maybe you don't have as, as strong a position, but I'm curious to know uh, how you approach that question. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, part of um, the conception of the three-dimensional environment um, is studied through common projection. So as mentioned, maybe with the objects, uh, a lot of those begin with elevation and then a, a spatial uh, um, environment like our rooms tend to begin with perspective. And so uh, we find the kind of primary, uh, sorry, primary perspectives 
um, early on in the project and then design to those. So a lot of the, the, the work um, has to do with kind of deliberate, um, uh, deliberate ways of seeing the work. Um, and so that's where control of perspective um, becomes essential. Um, and so, so to your question, it, I think it's also about how do you prioritize um, what's modeled, what's drawn, and and obviously we start to prioritize by establishing um, sort of critical um, points of view, i.e., perspectives. And those get drawn meticulously. But um, to to I guess the intent and the motives behind um, the sort of labor of drawing versus the um, the tendency to derive view from model, uh, meaning digital model or even I suppose physical model through photograph. Um, the intent to to draw um, rather than exclusively model those spaces just comes out of a desire to, um, I think, isolate information so that certain information can be privileged, some can be suppressed and be deliberate. So I would just add, uh, it allows or it accommodates greater control, um, greater deliberateness so forth. And we both teach. So um, the sort of uh, we're very, you know, empathetic to the conventions and history of, of drawing in our discipline. And um, let's maybe think of it as the enduring relevance of projection of perspective, of elevation, of plan. Um, it worked for a long time. <laughs> so um, it's not broken. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Carrie. I think we have one question from Charlotte. So just Charlotte, turn on your screen and feel free to ask. Okay, great. Um, I thank you so much for your talk. I, I was really excited by your fascination and excitement with Agnes Martin, one of my favorite artists from Canada, yay. Um, but I, I was curious about whether your viewing of her exhibit, um, was it, it was at the Guggenheim, I believe you said it was. I, yeah. I personally didn't see it, but did that present, did that just reaffirm your continue you know your fascination with the grid like the gridded form or did that bring up new a new fascination for you and your work a little bit of both um the grid uh is maybe a recurring um interest or affinity in our work but when it comes to agnes martin's work um something that comes to mind is um proximity or mm -hmm the difference, the work, the, the different reading the work takes when you're far or close to it. And I think that really fascinated us. So even with the, the Bucktown brick project that we referenced her work, the work can appear monolithic from across the street and then it becomes finer grained as you approach. And that sort of oscillation or that um, that double state for us uh, really excited us. And certainly um, we owe that credit to Agnes Martin. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny that you said, you know, her work can seem bo boring and I guess the repetitiveness perhaps has that semblance, but you know, how we translate it into your work is anything but boring. You know, the, the, the Aesop is the, Aes the Aesop store, um, the, the brick, it, it, it reverberates. It has this like 
movement despite the materiality being so heavy. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks. Gorgeous. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, uh, Charlotte. Uh, any other questions? No, we seem to have a, uh, uh, a shy crowd today. But uh, um, I'll maybe finish with a question a, a, that is not uh, uh, as much about a, um, a sort of the specific work, uh, but it's more about your longer uh, biography. Uh, I assume, and I might be completely wrong, but that you met Thomas, but you both went to UVA at the same time. Uh, and now you're working together. Uh, and one of the things that I always sort of uh, tell incoming students is that their time at the A school or wherever they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna meet people with whom they will sort of collaborate uh, and establish working relationships, not just during the time that they're here, but through life. Right, it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to really arrive to a place and really establish new connections. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about sort of the more biographical part of your, uh, um, a, a, of your practice, uh, where you met, how you worked together, uh, sort of, a, 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 et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I also always tell my students to, um, you know, look to your left and look to your right. That person may end up being your design partner or you might collaborate with them for the rest of your life. You, you just don't know. Um, yeah, uh, Thomas and I, we met uh, when we were around 18, um, smoking cigarettes probably, most likely outside of the A school. Um, at the time, uh, we probably shared a couple studios um, and, and probably form some kind of idealized um, hopes and ambitions for, for one day starting a collaboration together. Um, but before we got there, um, we collaborated with a couple of faculty members um, from the school and um, spent a couple summers um, in between our, our studies or in between our years at UVA um, working for, for these faculty uh, members. They're no longer at UVA, um, but they remain um, a tremendous kind of role model to, to, to both of us and to our practice. Um, they represented a sort of model of um, practitioner plus architect. And that model, um, that's sort of how we model ourselves as well. And so that was a really kind of formative experience working for them. Um, they also, they both went to Princeton and um, that's largely, um, or that largely contributed to, to our interests and decisions to go there as well. Um, and then, so, so I, after graduating from UVA, I moved to New York, Thomas moved to Brazil. Um, and then he would apply to Princeton and eventually um, go there a year later and I two years later. So we had a little bit of a, um, a, a separation and then we would reunite at Princeton a couple years later. Um, and then coincidentally, those two faculty members, Jason Johnson and Natalie Gatenio, um, won the Van Allen Institute Prize or the New York Prize. I don't think it exists anymore, but at the time um, it brought uh, um, installations into the Van Allen um, with, with uh, some bit of uh, kind of funding for that, uh, for that purpose. So they contacted us again and, and said, you know, we have another project. It's in New York. It's close to you guys. Um, do you guys want to get the band back together again and, and, and work on this installation um, for the summer? And so we were so excited and we spent the summer executing uh, the installation with them. And by the end, uh, we just sort of said to each other, like, we've been collaborating so long. Um, the next time we work together, it should be for ourselves. And so um, the Architectural League of New York is a really great organization. They put forward a lot of uh, competitions um, for sort of targeting young architects. Um, so we found one 
the 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 folly i think they still do that competition it's an annual competition and um we submitted an entry for it this is like probably i don't know a year um or two out of, of school and you know i'm moonlighting at my job he's moonlighting at his job and we're just kind of doing it on nights and weekends and uh we don't win the competition we get honorable mention i think but anyways that gave us kind of enough confidence to to keep going and so we would just sort of pick up um any like little scrappy projects or uh try to find competitions to work together on um and eventually um projects kind of came that way that is great thank you uh, uh so much carrie for uh, a fantastic uh, uh lecture and for a fantastic conversation uh very good to uh, uh partially see you uh <laughs> Bye. You, you can turn on the camera one last time maybe so that we can uh, see you thank you uh, uh say farewell uh and sort of hope that you will join us uh in person once uh, uh sort of conditions uh, uh, allow hopefully in the near future I love that. I love to. Thank you so much. Thank you all for, for being so attentive and such a lovely audience. Good luck. Great. Thank you so much.